Hi, Dr. Hey, Rob. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. Rob Weiss. And Tammy, I think you're here too, right? We're helping Correct. out. We're working on this. So folks, we're here to answer your questions. We're here every single week, whenever we can be, which is almost every week. Um, to answer questions about sex, love, and addiction. Um, I'm a sexologist and a social worker and a recovering person with a whole bunch of years working in, these, in this area, books and treatment centers and all that formal stuff. Um, and I just really like to be able to give back and learn what's going on with you so I can be current. So here we are volunteering our time to try to help. Let, and we have 20 people here and I hear you have questions. So let's go to work. We, we do have some questions. Um, so if you have questions, it has happened every week for the last bunch of months that we run out of time at the end. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would invite you to ask early so yours get answered. Um, so the first one is you'd mentioned last week that porn addiction is straightforward to treat. My partner has impulsive obsessive and compulsive addiction to incest, porn, and cyber sex, role-playing with women as young as 14 and usually 16. His sex drive with me is extremely low. He's making objectifying comments about women's bodies, compulsively ogles, stares at certain women, transgresses emotional boundaries with women at work, develops attractions and creates emotional fantasies about these and women, etc. So the next part, I've learned that he um, has encouraged me to leave the house, like to go out so that he could watch porn role play in cyber sex for an extended amount of time. He also woke up earlier than me so he could do it while he, I slept every day on his work laptop, which he insisted on bringing home every day. What pains me the most after the lies is that his staring and fantasizing is with small, young, white, or Asian women, which I don't look anything like. She's um, a darker skin tone, obviously can't change my skin color or make myself younger. Is this a relatively straightforward porn addiction or is this sex addiction will he always lust after teenage looking women of a particular race when he watches porn, what he watches in porn? So there's a lot there, but it's a great question about- There's a lot there, but it's yeah. really not that difficult a question in the sense that, um, the. so I don't know anything about your partner. I just hear, heard a whole laundry list of things that you said about him. and. Um, and I think the word, the emphasis on laundry list here, because you have a whole bunch of stuff that you're talking about. You know, if, if you said to me, what is a porn addict? I would basically say it's someone who, for the most part, really struggles to have intimate relationships, if at all, or to be sexual at all, because their primary focus is on pornography, hours and hours a day, sometimes, you know, taking away from all kinds of parts of their lives. And most porn addicts really have difficulty or have had difficulty maintaining or having relationships at all. Some of them have never had sex with a person. They've just been looking at images. So, but, but this is very different from what you talk about. I mean, you talk about someone who has desires that are, you might consider alternative or unusual or different for you that you didn't know about. You talk about a lot of underage stuff. Um, and, and by the way, when in my, I've had a little training in, defend, in the sex offender world and I will tell you that the translation for a slim young Asian girl is underage, meaning that oftentimes if I'm working with a sex offender who has absolutely no interest in adult female bodies, if I can find him someone he's attracted to who is slim and relatively hairless and relatively small and light skinned, that might be more of a turn on than a big busty woman, um, no matter her color, because he's really mostly turned on by younger people. And so I don't know if, if that's, you know, when I hear young and younger images and underage, and then I hear young, slim, Asian, I begin to think, wow, what's wrong with body hair? You know, what's wrong with adult bodies? What's wrong? Like, and it could be true that he is simply fetishized or has some fantasies in particular that turn him on about slim Asian women. Who knows? And that doesn't mean necessarily that he's not attracted to you. It could just be something that is in him and he's interested in looking at and masturbating to. But you don't describe this in a question like way. You describe this as a whole bunch of different kinds of problems. A low sex drive with you, objectifying other women, um, being emotionally engaged with other women in inappropriate ways when he's in a relationship with you, like hitting on other women or, or flirting with other women, knowing that that would hurt you, um, crossing boundaries at work. This is more than a porn problem. This is more what I would consider to be just off the top a plain old sex addict, because sex addicts are usually into multiple issues, having multiple problems in multiple arenas, and some of them involve, may involve images or online, but a lot of it involves real life activity. And also sex addiction, um, sex addiction involves a lot of lying, 
a lot of keeping compartmental, compartmentalizing, keeping different parts of your life in different spots. Um, and th this sounds like a broader problem around sex for him, which could be related to trauma, could be related to fetishism, could it be related to his personality. This is where some therapy and assessment comes in. Um, you know, and you know, if not, I mean, I, Tammy can always refer you to someone in, in wherever you live. You can write her here at, uh, ta where are we? Sex and Relationship Healing? Tammy at Sex and Relationship Healing? Tammy at SeekingIntegrity.com because the treatment center is Seeking Integrity. That is true. But anyway, I mean, you ask a very deep and and uh, and uh, multiple kind of question. The only thing I can say to you is go get some support for yourself. I want to make sure that you don't end up carrying all these issues. I already see you a little bit like, well, I can't be younger. I can't be slimmer. This isn't about you. This is about some issues that he has. And, you know, if he was into men, it would, you couldn't be a man either. He's into stuff like that. Like it's part of him and it has nothing to do with who you are and who you're not. But as like any partner who's feeling ignored and like, he would rather be anywhere but with you, um, you know, you're taking some of this on and you're making, it's making you feel bad about you. And that's the part I would suggest to go to a drop-in group, get some support, feel less alone with the victimization you're going through because you're getting gaslighted. I mean, I think this is a relationship where he's telling you, I'd never be home at six, or I never said I was going to be home at six, but he did, or I never said I'd come be home this weekend, but he did. And, you know, slowly but surely you can go crazy with people like this. So hang out with some sane people and we can help with that. Um, did you have any thoughts, Tammy? Well, I just, the concern of the, on the work laptop, there's a lot of companies that um, monitor that stuff. And I mean, you know, people lose their jobs because of you know, what they're looking at on work computers. So, and so, their children. Yeah, yes, yes, that's true too. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it, from the, he sounds like he's at risk and, something bad's going to happen, man. But I 100% agree with Dr. Rob. Somebody, and I forgot which webinar I was doing last week, but somebody said, you know, you could be, we could replace you with anybody and it wouldn't matter. He's still going to do what he's going to do. So, you know, I think that that's part of the thing when Dr. Rob is talking about take care of yourself. Absolutely. So um, the next uh, question is, where do we draw the line between actual narcissistic personality disorder and narcissistic tendencies that come with addiction? Well, I think that that's not really the right question, but it's a good question because people can be narcissistic outside of having an addiction. You know, you could just be someone who likes a lot of attention and really kind of vulnerable person. You know, you just be a little narcissistic. And, but when called on it, or, you know, you kind of settle down. Or you could be someone who's really, really narcissistic, but not a full personality disorder. In fact, I have to tell you in 25 to 30 years of doing treatment with a lot of narcissistic men, and you ladies know who I'm talking about, it's the people you're involved with. Um, I think I've seen three or four full on personality disorders. Personality disorders are very common if you're a fairly new therapist because everybody looks crazy when you're new but when you've sat back and really over 10 20 30 years looked at lots of cases i can see profound narcissism related to personality related to trauma related to addiction and i can also see how it shows up for people who have full-on personality disorders so it's not as easy as you describe as of course nothing ever is right but let me see if I can break some things down for you. First of all, for everyone who's listening, everyone who, anyone who is actively practicing an addiction is a full on narcissist by definition. Because if I'm a narcissist, that means that the only thing that matters to me is what I want, what I care about, and I'll do anything, wherever I can to get it, basically. And if you're an addict, that means your life focus is on that drug or that experience, and you don't really care as much about your family, your friends, your job. You care about that drug or that experience. So everybody who's more focused on what they want when they want it than other things in life, which is every addict who's active and narcissistic people, but every addict looks narcissistic when he or she is in active addiction. And you'll often hear me say, make this, I, I've made up a story about someone who might have been a heroin addict and took all of their kids' college fund money out of the college fund because they wanted to buy drugs when they were active in their addiction. Very narcissistic, right? I don't give a poop about my kids. I'm just going to take the money and go do what I want. But when sober, he gets in touch with how much he loves his kids, how much he wants to support them, how badly he feels about his past behavior, and he gets three jobs to pay that money back. So that's that kind of narcissism I associate with addiction. 
where someone is so addicted that nothing else matters or everything else comes second. And when you push the addiction aside, most of us who've been acting out as active addicts for a long time are used to getting our own way. We're used to manipulating and being able to hide. And so even once sober for quite a while, we will still push boundaries, still try to be right, still, you know, because we haven't learned any better. And that's what 12-step programs are for. That's what therapy is for. That's what it, weekends and workshops and to, so that we can grow and refine from being a very narcissistically focused addict to someone who's still very narcissistically focused, but no longer addicted to someone who has more room for other people inside. And how much more room someone has inside is really up to them. Um, you know, it's taken me personally probably 20, 25 years to be open to really let a few people in. And that's about all I can do, but I'm glad for that. I know people who live double lives and never let anybody in. They just are this for this person and that for that person. And really they're the ones who are in charge and they're mostly alone inside. Um, so, you know, it really is a matter of each person, but I, I will say this and I'll shut up. Um, you really can't look at narcissism until you eliminate the addiction because when someone is acting out an addiction, they always look narcissistic by definition. So they have to be sober or on that behavior or that substance or both before they can even begin to open up to other people. Tammy, do you have stuff? Yeah, no, I, I agree that, you know, addicts in active addiction are all narcissistic and, you know, hopefully if we're working a program and willing, you know, we, we get different. So it's where the meeting is. So oh, let me say something else because this sure. person wrote us back in the chat and she said, and I have to respond. She said, Tammy, I'm fairly certain my husband's a narcissist and probably a sociopath. I just don't know which came first. So let me explain, actually, since you asked that, let me explain um, what's wrong with narcissistic people and what's wrong with sociopaths and what makes a narcissist. So narcissists, one of our key challenges, and I say our, because I have a lot of narcissism for sure, but I am not a personality disorder. Um, we lack empathy. So because for various reasons, trauma issues we've been through, as a narcissist, I can lack empathy. I can not think about how my being late is going to affect you. I cannot, I'll give you a perfect example. Okay, Tammy, this is something I did last night, which lacked empathy. Okay. Um, it's a bit of a story, but it's worth it. When I came back from vacation a few weeks ago and we were out of the country, my spouse bought all this candy that he wanted to bring to work to give to the kids where he works. But the night before he went to work, I found the candy and I ate a little bit of it, maybe more than a little. So by the time he got the candy to bring to school to the kids he works with, there wasn't as much left and he was really mad. So last night, which is months later, we went to the grocery store and me and he bought a big bag of candy. What are those? A candy corn for Halloween in little bags that he was going to give to the kids at school where he works. But last night, I, and he gave me a couple little bags and said, enjoy these. And I did. But then after he went to bed, I thought, well, the, he couldn't have eaten the whole bag and there must be more. And so I got into his work bag and I found like a whole pound of candy kip corns. Now I would say I only ate probably, okay, 10 of those little bags, but that was probably half. <laughs> anyway, the point is he was furious. And I was like, honey, it's just candy. What difference does it make? I could buy more tomorrow. It's not gonna matter. He was furious. And it's because I didn't have the empathy to realize the first time that I got into the kids for school candy, that that was upsetting and he was really upset with me. Why would I be getting into the kids candy again? Even if it just came from the store, didn't I learn my lesson the first time that that upset him? No, I didn't because I lacked empathy. And honestly, the candy was more important to me than probably his feelings. So not consciously, but as it played out. By the way, Tammy, I'm going to the store tonight to buy more candy before he goes to work tomorrow. But the point is, I can hurt someone and even hurt them again because I, I, I forget, I lack empathy. I don't remember that that's something that will hurt them or bother them, or it seems so silly to me, it wouldn't bother me. But here's the deal, and this is the good thing about being a narcissist. If you confront me as my spouse did last night and say, I am pissed that you took this candy, I will think about it and I'll say, wow, oh, I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't mean, to I'm sorry. In other words, I can feel remorse. I may not in the moment know that I've done something that's going to let you down later, but when I find out I let you down, I will act 
on that, to try to not let you down again, to try not feel like a shit again, to try to do be a better person. So narcissists lack empathy, but we do have remorse and remorse is what brings people to treatment. Because if someone, nobody would come to a treatment center, ours or anybody else's, if they didn't feel badly in some way about their behavior. So, but sociopaths, so let me just give you that. Sociopaths lack empathy. They don't foresee that something they do is gonna hurt someone, but when they find out it does, they don't care. Sociopaths lack both empathy and remorse. They not only don't notice when they're gonna do something that hurts you, but when they find out that it hurts you, it's your problem for being hurt, not their problem for having done it. So the fact that I'm able to say, oh, wow, that was crappy of me to take that candy. I didn't mean to let you down. Even though I didn't think it was a big deal, I'm going to go get more candy for you and apologize. A sociopath would say, screw you. I'll just eat the rest of the candy. You can go buy some more tomorrow. My Narcissists can grow. We have the opportunity to take the pain of hurting people and use it if you're willing to hang out there with us to try to not hurt you as much the next time and maybe less the time after that. But sociopaths don't give a shit that they've hurt you, just want you around for the meal ticket and the eat whatever they can get. And if that doesn't work out, they will move on without thinking twice about it. So I would ask you, if the person that you love has does not show remorse, does not show regret, doesn't seem to be bothered at all by hurting you, and when they, you go to move in, to confront, to challenge, they just say, look, do you want me around? Or are you gonna push me? You probably have a sociopath because they're basically saying, if you ask me to look at myself, I'm gonna get rid of you. I don't care how much I've hurt you. I don't wanna look at myself. And that is more of a sociopath. One more thing, there is a book. I'll put it in the chat. It is a very good book. I love reading it. I love sharing it called The Sociopath. Sociopath Next Door. And it's by a woman named Martha Stout. And it explains sociopaths, not the ones that are in prison necessarily, but the one who might be your neighbor or your husband. And I'd recommend it. Okay. I just, you sent it to me, so I sent it to everybody. Oh. So it's all good. But thank you for explaining that. And please get two bags of candy so that you don't steal your husband's well, candy now, again. Well, okay, I will say Or this. three bags of candy. So I don't know. <laughs> He will not say, I just have to say, my husband will not say that he threw the half pound of candy that was left to me last night. He will say that he dropped it and it hit me. So we had a discussion about how he expresses his anger. And I almost made that more important than the candy, which I could have done as a narcissist said, you, what you did to me is so shitty that forget the candy, but I didn't. I said, I didn't like what you did, but you're right. You know, anyway, please go ahead. Thank you for, follow. no, thank you for positive growth and not being a sociopath. So the next question is, my husband was looking at the news on the Google feed and clicked on a site that said cruise passenger banned for life following dangerous swimsuit photo shoot. Our counselor said it was a slip and not to get his news from Google feed anymore. My husband disagrees that it was a slip. I found out because I got an email from A2U as a questionable behavior. Thoughts? Okay, I'll be honest. That's what I try to do. I don't really think it's any of your business. I think that if that what is needed here is the rebuilding of trust. And if your husband says, I looked at something, it didn't mean anything to me, and I let my sponsor know, or whatever, I don't think it's your job to say that it meant more. You may be suspicious, you may be anxious, you may be fearful, but that's not your job. Your husband has to be able to get to the point where he can come to you and say, I think I wasn't in a good place. I shouldn't have been doing that. But it's not your job to say that unless, you know, obviously, if you see him hit on somebody or do something so obvious and he denies it, you know, that's different. But glanced at something, you know, we get as recovering people to make up our own mind, even if you don't like it, about how we feel about our recovery, because ultimately it is our recovery, not yours. I'm not recovering for you. I'm recovering for me. And I want to recover in a way that feels safe and sane. And sometimes I might look at someone and find them attractive and take that in for a second and look away. That doesn't mean that I'm going to run off with them and hurt you. And I still get to have the opportunity to be human and look. So what are they writing? They're writing bad things down there. I can see it. What are they saying? The sugar ain't what? The, the sugar, sugar isn't good for you. So maybe, you know, go to Sugar Aholics Anonymous, LOL. So I'm not sure what that means. But it's about you and the candy. But stay on this standpoint. I will. So 
Um, but I sort of made my point and I don't mean to be mean, like, you know, you guys know, and you spouses, especially how hard I am on the addicts here and in my writing. But I do think that you spouses, when you're fearful or new and understandably so have a hard time letting us find our own path because you've been lied to because you've been cheated on and it, but i think if you see look over our shoulder do you see something and we're willing to acknowledge it and say yeah that wasn't but hey it was this i would listen and just respect that and move on you know because if you poke at every little thing it will be it's so hard, much harder for us to want to tell you things you know we're human and if i tell you something even if, especially if it's going to be upsetting I want to know that it's not going to turn into a hurricane. I want to know that I'm at least going to have the chance to try to be honest with you. And if you, every time he says, I, I'm being honest, you say, you're, no, you're not. Then he's, then I don't know what his motivation would be to even try. So it doesn't sound like what you found or saw was grievy, grievous or horrible, or I would let it go. That's what I would. And I would say to my husband, I'm sorry I made such a big deal of that but you have to understand everything I see in front of me is a red flag and it's all red and it's all waving. So I don't, and I don't trust you, but it would be cool if you could acknowledge that. Cause it's not like he was sitting there looking at porn. So there's one for the addicts. <laughs> well, I, so I, I want to tease this out a little bit more. So now you've got the therapist saying it's a slip, the husband saying it's not. And oh. so, so can you like, like, what do you do when you've got a difference of opinion from that standpoint? Well, I don't, First of all, whose therapist is it? Um, our therapist. So Not it's our me. counselor. So it sounds like a no, couple's counselor. No. Okay. okay. My sponsor or my therapist? Couples therapist. First of all, I don't believe in couples with these issues seeing the same therapist. I think it's a bad idea because it's so personal. So I do understand going to couples therapy, but if you're going to couples therapy, it's not a couples therapist job to work the addiction and say, you had a slip, you didn't. That's not their job. So I think that if your husband is seeing a therapist and has a sponsor and you have a question and you say, I want you to bring this to your sponsor, or your therapist, and he does, and he comes back and says, no, I, I think it was okay. And I feel okay about it. Then you need to put on your big girl pants and say, okay. Um, and it isn't, you know, I wouldn't ask this therapist to split. Um, I don't think that's their job um, to make you right and him wrong. It's the therapist's job. I, and I would, I, if it were me, I'd confront the therapist. I don't think it's their job to say you were right and you were wrong. I think it's the therapist's job to say, I, you're upset about this and you don't seem to be paying much attention. What's going on? And for him to say, well, she really doesn't get it. This wasn't a big deal. And for you to say, but for me, it was, that's the therapist's job to work out what's happening in the room. It's not his or her job to say, well, he had a slip. So you have to, I don't think, leave that to sponsors, in my opinion. Thanks. Yeah, I, you know, I agree. And I always talk about, you know, the couples therapist, the client is the couple, the coupleship, you know, it's not your individual. So, okay. You ready for the next one? Wait, I have to say something about oh, sugar. Please. I oh. don't really like sugar all that much. In fact, I, it makes me spacey and uncomfortable just so you guys know. And I'm grateful because I will never be too fat. Chocolate chip cookies. Absolutely. But there's something about candy canes, corn, candy corn. I don't know what it is. It's just for folks, I don't know, they got it right. They got candy corn right. I could eat that all day long. But it's that particular flavor, not just any sugar. I'm not a cheap date with sugar, okay? Thank you. You're a once a year, you've got a but, season for it. Well, actually, sex, any, you know, all, anyway, it was pretty open, but the sugar, not so much. Okay, so the next question What does it say about a porn addict partner is seemingly focused on moms? Uh, um, I've seen his collection of MILF videos, including mom and son videos, and now he seems to be seeking arrangements with moms. The irony is our relationship went downhill when we started infertility treatment, more so his behavior escalated when I gave birth, officially became a mother. He claims that no one cares about the plot, but I'm curious. No one cares about the what? Plot, like, you know. All right, yeah, yeah, so. so why it happened. This is another, like, let's give one to the addicts one. So I like this. Okay. So here's the deal. Um, ladies, if you look at international search engines, America and everywhere, and you look at the word that men most often pair with searches for sex. In other words, if I were looking for sex and I were putting in like, uh, uh, I'm a gay guy. So if I put in gay massage or gay, uh, I don't know, threesomes or you know, I would be putting in those words with gay because that's what I was interested in, threesomes or massage or whatever it is I wanted to see. And I'd probably use the word porn. 
So for heterosexual men worldwide, when they seek porn and they put in the word porn, women, and then whatever it is, what is the word that they most often put in? What are the top five? And I happen to know a couple of them because I've looked at some of the research. So here's some of the top five that men most consistently put in their searches worldwide when they're looking for the word sex. Um, one of the number one and two, youth. Youth, young, young youth, those are big ones. Why are men interested in youth? Now, if I was a partner of a sex addict, I'd be like, why is my husband typing in the word youth with the word porn? Well, the truth is that all men are typing in the word youth with porn because we are genetically engineered to want younger people who will bear children. That doesn't mean that we're looking at teenagers or 12 year olds, but when we mean young bodies, we are actually, uh, what's the word? Um, we are programmed, I guess, to be attracted to younger people. Doesn't mean we have to have sex with them, doesn't mean we have to flirt with them, doesn't mean we mean we have to look at them. But for a man to put in young, youth, and porn, not unusual. For a man to be more attracted to porn of younger people, not unusual. Um, what is one of the other top five words that men most often internationally put in with the word porn? I guess maybe you aren't gonna like men anymore when you hear all this. Mom and mother is a top five word internationally for men who, in fact, some countries is the number one word that people pair with the word porn. Mom porn, mother porn, big mother breast porn, and all that stuff. I make of, the, of it that that's what men like to look at. <laughs> and not much else. If it was just him, and I'm really glad to be the person answering this question because I actually know the answer to this question. I actually know what the research says because I can imagine someone saying, oh my God, he's looking at mother porn, maybe it's an incest and maybe this, most of the men on the planet put the word mom or dad in with, I, I haven't personally, but many men do. So I don't think that, I wouldn't make much of it. And I, if he said, and I guess these are his words and I kind of like them, um, he claims that no one cares about the plot. Well, I, do, I don't think that's entirely true. I do think there's something about the plot that engages him, but not, it's not, probably not a lot more important than plots that engage most of the men on the planet when they're looking at porn. However, the other part you wrote is interesting. I wanna say something about it. You said, the irony is that our relationship went downhill when we started infidelity treatment and more so his escalate when I gave birth. So let me say something about that. I've worked with male sex addicts for almost 30 years and I am one. Um, they, we universally hate your fertility treatment. Men actually, just say this, forget sex addicts. Men hate your fertility treatment. We'll go along with it, but we hate it. I know this. Also fact, why do we hate it? Because we have to orgasm on demand on this date at that time. It has to be in this place at that tube and we have to inject you. It's just not a lot of fun for us. My experience with the men I've spoken to. Men start to feel I know you ladies will laugh, more like an object than a person going, going through a fertility treatment because we kind of feel like we're this there to perform this function and get that swimmer where it needs to go. And men don't like that, you know? It doesn't matter that you don't like it either. I'm just saying we don't like it. So men are universally not particularly enjoying sex with their spouses when we're going through fertility treatment. So if I was a male sex addict, I probably, I would imagine absolutely that would be a time when my behavior would escalate. Number two, um, Almost every sex addict male that I've worked with has issues with feeling abandoned by the person they're close to. And while most men will feel abandoned by a woman giving birth, because on some level her attention has now completely left him and is focused on that. Um, most healthy men are able to say, okay, well, you know, my job is to hold this whole thing together and love them both. And there'll be times when I'm really important, times when I'm not, because the first beginning when kids are born, men aren't that important, you know, particularly it's you guys who are. We become really important later, but not right then. It is very typical in the sex addict world, and I talk about this and write about this, for men to act out sexually outside of their relationships when their spouse has recently given birth. Um, there's even an Ashley Madison ad. A lot of the Ashley Madison advertising, Ashley Madison is a site for married people to find other married people to find sex. And I used to use Ashley Ma Madison advertising in some of my lectures. And Tammy, you probably remember some of that. I do. Guys who were singing, you know, uh, what they used to sing. Anyway, 
what you'll notice if you go online and look at most at Ashley Madison advertising is it's focused on men who are in their early 30s and not on men in their late 20s, not on men in their late 30s. Why that? And of course, the answer is, is that most young men in their early 30s who are heterosexual and are in a relationship like a marriage, that's around the time that their spouses are having kids. And so Ashley Madison, which is a site dedicated to getting people to cheat so they can make money, already knows that men in their early 30s who have wives who are pregnant or having kids are more likely to cheat. And that's outside of being a sex addict. So actually, I think your husband is right on the norm. <laughs> the fact that he might put in mom and with porn is typical for many more men than you probably would like to know and not at all unusual. And the fact that his acting out escalated as you see, it doesn't matter that he was going to be a dad and you were going to be a mom. The fact that he looks at MILF porn is unrelated to the fact that he's now married to one, okay? Unrelated. Um, what he's married to is someone whose attention went away from him for a, a nanosecond or for a year. And that shift in your focus left him feeling abandoned and alone and wanting to act out. By the way, that's not your problem. You were perfectly fine as a mom. It, like I said, a healthier man might start playing basketball twice a week and then realize his role and get some needs met elsewhere and go with a men's group and, but, or a new dad's group or something. But the unhealthy male is gonna feel that abandonment, which is natural, and then act it out. So everything you described about your husband is just kind of normal for any sex addict I've ever met. And hopefully he's getting some qualified help so that he yes. can engage with you and be the dad that he hopefully aspires to be. So. Well, I want to say something about that. And I know I'm taking up a lot of time tonight and all questions may not get answered, but that's how it goes. Um, Cause this is useful for you guys. Mm -hmm. When I work with men who are sex addicts um, and our fathers, um, I will often have men come in to see me. And, and I don't know if you know this, some of you know this, we run a treatment center, Tammy and I, well, I, I, Tammy and I, we have a group of people who run treatment. And I've been doing and running treatment for 25 years in various settings. And we have a program out here and I've been talking to guys recently. And I've been reminded of this because I've been sitting around the treatment program talking to some of the folks who some of whom I think are on tonight. Anyway, um, I often hear from men, you know, who are married with kids. You know, I know I was a bad husband. I know I treated my wife badly. I know I wasn't a good partner, blah, 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 blah. But I've been a good dad. You know, I always show up on time for work and I always bring home paycheck and I'm always there to pick them up at school and I never, and I go to their games and you know, whatever. And of course, universally, all of those men are wrong. And it's very difficult for them to take this in, but it is a talking point for me is that, you know, when you don't, when you leave your, the person who gave birth to your children, when you leave the mother of your children anxious, worried, fearful, uncertain, doubting, um, that is not going to make the best mom that she can be to those kids. And that means you're not being the best father, even if you are the best father in and of yourself. By making your spouse doubt anything, feel anything other than secure when taking care of those kids, you are hurting your children. And every man who's been a sex addict when his kids were zero to, to 20 knows that his kids have been harmed by it, whether he wants to admit it or not. And part of admitting that is the path to growth. So yes, Tammy, you are right. He might just become a good dad to that child and that would be the best gift of all. Okay, I'm done. Okay, so there's one in the chat where I'm gonna read you. Hello and thank you for your time. Having been in recovery now for two plus years and previously sober from porn for over a year, I eventually slipped back, back into viewing it again. My therapist suggested looking into ACT therapy uh, to help with my recovery. What are your thoughts on ACT therapy applied to pornography addiction? Okay. Um, so I know this therapy. I don't know everything, but I know some of these things. Um, addiction treatment requires cognitive behavioral therapy. There is no other form of therapy that works. I, I don't know who made the recommendation. I'm sure they're a very nice person and well-meaning, but ACT, EFT, DBT, does and NPR, <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, you need to do cognitive behavioral therapy for anyone who has a reasonable intellect. Um, we don't do trauma work. I mean, we look at it, we consider it, but the primary thing we're doing in addiction work is figuring out what the hell is going on with your addiction. And that has a lot to do with your thinking and your, your fantasies and your denial and how you look at it. It's a lot has to do with how, where, what is real here and now for you in the present and how you're living your life. And my experience in a couple of decades of doing this work is that I've seen people go to endless trauma work to try to cure their addiction 
I've seen people go to and, and seen the other side of people going to analysts for three times a week for 12 years and coming out and still acting out their addiction, only now they've lost their family. I've seen people go to lots of kinds of therapy, but there's a reason why there are experts in this particular area. I would not send somebody who had cancer to, I would not say to someone who had cancer, you know, I hear nutritionists do a really good job with cancer. I just wouldn't, because even though I know nutrition is an important part of cancer, I don't know poop about treating cancer. And so if I didn't really understand addiction treatment, I probably would say something like, well, maybe ACT or EFT or DBT or, and yes, those all mean things, but I wouldn't if I understood addiction. If I understood addiction, I would say, find someone who is a professional who knows what they're doing, and not just in general addiction, but if it's a sex problem, make sure they know about sex. If it's a gambling problem, make sure they know about gambling. Treatment should be specific, focused, and really dealing with the problem as it is while reflecting back on the past and understanding the past and being curious about the past. Other forms of treatment for other issues will be really useful when the addiction is stabilized. But until that happens, all bets are off and most other forms of therapy are fairly useless. And let me tell you why. Because if I am lying, if I am living a double life, if I am keeping secrets, if I am struggling with the basics of addiction, then you can do any kind of treatment you want with me. And all I'm going to keep bringing in the room is the drama of having hidden things and gotten diseases and hurt you. And because I'm still struggling with the addiction and therefore everything I bring into the therapy room, whether it come five times a week or once, whether you do EMDR with me or EFT, it doesn't matter. I am still going to be dealing with the active problems of the addiction. So you have to help someone get sober to stop their behavior, to stop the shame, the lying, the secrecy, the compartmentalization, and then give it a month or two, give it a little bit of time, some stability, and we can start to look at deeper, longer term issues uh, using a variety of techniques. But no, I would not recommend ACT for initial addiction treatment. Thank you for that. So a couple of things. Um, First of all, and just because someone says they can treat sex addiction, don't, I mean, look at their credentials. There's one certification out there that somebody brought up today, and it's problematic in the relationship, but it's one of those that you watch some DVDs and poof, you're certified. And this is complex. And so, you know, I feel bad because the partner is having to deal with the addict going to this therapist that, in my opinion, and I'm not a professional, I'm not a clinician, I don't work in well, the wait, wait, therapy. Wait, you have yeah. You have worked in this field for, for a 15, long time. Years. Yeah. You have watched professionals be trained from all over the world. You do have a good sense of, you don't have to say that. You do know who does, does good work and who doesn't. Okay. Sorry. I do know who does good work. And I don't think that somebody just watching some DVDs is going to make you a good therapist in this particular arena. So do your homework, call me, email me. I'll be happy to help you. Um, I also want to, um, so you, you're talking about, You've been sober and then you've relapsed. I want to share, I shared at the beginning of this, there's a three-day workshop. It's kind of like a jump start to help you get on track. I would, in, I would invite you to consider the Seeking Integrity Los Angeles three-day workshop. There's one November 8th through 10th in Los Angeles. It, it might be exactly what you need to get you know, on track to be able to move forward. So um, we are doing some kick butt work and I appreciate you're talking about it, Tammy. Um, I think I've got three workshops now. I think we're going to have a men who are struggling, like they've been working on this or just not getting it, struggling with sex addiction workshop. We're going to, you know, or, and, and the other part of this is they just don't, and I really mean this, they just don't get what is upsetting their spouse so much. After all, they're not having sex with those other people. So what's the problem? It's kind of an introduction to what's wrong with you and wake up kind of thing. I would call it boot camp, but whatever. We're also doing a couples workshop for couples that are really struggling with infidelity, healing, and sort of dealing with the trauma of infidelity around uh, chronic infidelity or sex addiction. And then Dr. David Fawcett is doing chemsex intensives where we're doing three days with people who are really struggling with stimulant sex like meth sex, coke sex. And I think workshops are an awesome way, oh, excuse my California language, I think they're a really useful way to begin to conquer issues with experts that you might not ordinarily get to work with where you live, but they're going to give you a big jump start. Yes. Um, so that's that. Okay. Thank you. And so the next question kind of follows what you already said. So my husband is one, uh, the, is the one who said he was entitled and horny uh, went to his first therapy session. He recommended DBT therapy. What are your thoughts to someone like this? So you just mentioned DBT. So, you know, so again, 
Uh, it sounds like he went to a general. I was thinking when you were talking about, you know, the cancer, I was like, you know, I go to my general doctor for general things, but when I needed my sinus surgery, I went to a specialist. And so I want somebody who actually knows what they're doing. But I think part of the problem in the therapy world, and this is worth saying for everybody, is that everyone, not everyone, I really want to say this right. It's not unusual for there to be various trends that go through the therapy field and Tammy and I have been long, around long enough to say, oh, everyone thinks this is what cures everyone. Oh, it must be this. It must be EMDR. Everyone raised to EMDR. It must be that. And then there are addiction protocols for EMDR. And they don't really work that well. But because uh, it, it's a cognitive thing, you have to know things, not just feel them. So anyway, then it was, you know, DBT. DBT is going to be great for everybody in the movie. You know, so we, we find things that are successful in helping people in ways we had not anticipated. Unfortunately, what can happen in my field is, People get really excited. They're like, oh, that's going to fix everything. And then we're out of our depth. So I would ask you, and I think it's a great thing to do, go online and look up ACT, if that's what you want to learn, and addiction, or especially in particular, ACT treatment and sex addiction, or look up EMDR and sex addiction. So if you don't see 100 articles that explain how that therapy can help, here's another way to find out if this will help your family, right? Just look up the name of the therapy, DBT and sex addiction. If you don't see 100 articles, therapists all over the country, books written, then you know it's not really a thing. Um, you know, look up EMDR and trauma. You will find books and books and articles and articles because EMDR and trauma, boy, are they, is that the thing? But if you looked up EMDR and behavioral addiction or EMDR and gambling, you might find a few people who've poked at it, but you're not going to find a lot of stuff. And that is a really good way to, I think, evaluate just simply at home. Is this something that people look at when they're dealing with sex addiction, love addiction, intimacy disorders, drug addiction? Pull out the names of those things and see what you see. Um, I, if you don't see research, books, and a lot of material, what you're looking at is people who have tried things like... I'm an addiction specialist and I studied this particular thing and I want to try these things together and oh, it worked in some of my people and then I'm writing about it and talking about it and I'm telling everybody I know, oh my God, you should try this thing. Well, I go to a conference on sex addiction and I tell everybody that they got to try this and I'm so convincing they all go do it. That doesn't mean it really works. So um, we do, I do know what works. I've been doing this for a long time. Cognitive behavioral therapy with a serious reflection back on trauma compulsivity, mental health. I mean, this, there are really some basic things that we do that transcend, I think, trends in therapy. I am a believer in DBT for the right people in the right work and the right circumstances. I am a believer in EMDR and ACT with the right people in the right circumstances. But basic psychotherapy for addiction is cognitive behavioral. Thank you. So this is uh, someone, I'm a 50 year old recovering sex and love addict and male. I've been in a relationship since July and I find myself focusing on her physical flaws, but I don't express these things. We have a great connection and values in common and open communication. When I have these thoughts, I wonder if maybe I wasn't ready to be in a relationship in the first place. Am I looking for a fantasy person who doesn't exist, i.e. the perfect woman? Am I just too afraid to be alone? Did I settle? I used to escape into long distance internet relationships, prostitutes, as well as porn. I have three years sexual sobriety from my from any commercial transaction for sex and about a year and a half from porn. Any notes, dating at 50 is very different from dating at 30. I realize now I was too superficial in the past, but it is coming up again, even though I have a wonderful relationship with this lady who herself is divorced for three years from a husband who was a sex addict. Well, interestingly, um, thank you, Tammy. I, 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 don't, I show up on intherooms.com once a week on Friday nights. I do the same meeting group, if you will. And this particular question gets asked a lot in that group and not so much over here. So um, I think this is, I'm really glad that this question came up. Um, so, sir, I think you're a sir. Sir, what is wrong with you is I can diagnose you over the internet. You have an intimacy disorder, intimacy disorder. People with intimacy disorders like us the most leading edge of that is the sex addiction or the porn addiction or the affairs. The leading edge is the most obvious edge of the problem. And the most obvious edge of the problem is the addiction or the compulsion. But when you remove that and you and I try to date, you get to the underlying pieces of the intimacy disorder, which is something you mentioned in your, in your text. 
It's our fear of intimacy. You have to get both ends of it. The reason that I went out and had sex with strangers in transactions was so that, because those people could never hurt me. Those people could never let me down. I was paying them. Or they were so fascinated with me in that in the moment hot sex thing that they weren't going to hurt me. They weren't going to let me down because they wanted me sexually. In other words, as a sex addict, I deeply understand that I can, in short, quick ways, get my emotional needs met in anonymous sexual and romantic situations, more or less, without risking my heart, without risking my emotions. And yet for the moment, that will satisfy my hunger for connection, like potato chips do when you're hungry, or those candy corns I like. They won't really feed you, but they will shut up your hunger for a little while. However, what you're trying to do is exactly what you should be doing, which is getting to the deeper thing, which is really connecting with someone. And guess what? Some of the time you have great sex, some of the time you enjoy each other, some of the time you, ha you like this person, maybe you've even found someone you might get along with. Terrific. The problem is, is that now the other edge of our intimacy disorder comes up, the fear of connection. And let me explain to you how that shows up for us. After a while, after getting to know someone, after beginning to enjoy them, and the sheen has worn off a little bit, we kind of know them, we start to judge them. And we sit back and we say, oh, I didn't realize they had that crease in their chin. Wow, they, that, that underarm, that kind of smells funny. And we start to objectify parts of them and say, look at those thighs. I'm not sure I could ever hang out with those thighs. We start to objectify and push the people away. This is the same disease that leaves us running after strangers and paying them for sex. It's the other end of it. So without getting unduly complex, here's a way to start working on it. This is definitely a therapy issue. This is definitely a treatment issue. Come see us for two weeks, by the way. I have no problem saying soliciting my program. I will help you with this problem. But I'll give you a very quick and simple solution toward trying to start helping it on your own. First of all, you have to have a conversation with this woman and tell her that you have problems with intimacy and problems with sex and that while, you know, hopefully you've explained to her already that you're a sex addict. And she may know about the leading edge of your addiction, which is what you do acting out. Now you have to tell her the other part. What I'm learning about myself, you have to tell her, is I'm also afraid of intimacy and I'm afraid of connection. And sometimes, even though I wanna be close to you and I like you, I find myself backing away. And then you have to tell her, and next time I do that, I'm going to tell you about it. This is the, I'll say mistake, that we all make. We think, oh my God, I'm judging their thighs and they smell funny and I really wanna run out of here, but I'm gonna pretend like everything's fine and I'm gonna be cool because I don't wanna upset them. And, and that's when we really run away from ourselves because that's when we convince ourselves we can't be with that person because we're lying inside of a lie. Here's how it goes in the other direction. You have a conversation with this woman and you explain to her your vulnerabilities. And then the next time you're sitting together and having TV and watching TV and she says, come sit closer and you think I'd rather eat dirt. Turn to her and say, can we turn off the TV for a second? I just need to let you know, I'm feeling a little distance tonight. You know, as much as I care about you tonight, I find myself judging you, pushing you away. And I just want you to know it's not about you, but let's just sit a little apart tonight and watch TV. And maybe tomorrow we can spend, be closer. Just bust yourself on it. Don't try to be slick. Don't try to be cool. Tell her. This does two things. One, it lets you know who she is when you make yourself more vulnerable. Is she someone who says, but I need you to be more present. But what do you mean? If she makes it about her, like, like uh, I thought you liked me, I thought you care. If she can't understand that this is really about you, that will tell you something about the relationship. It tells you that maybe this is someone you're not as likely to be able to open fully up to because she's gonna make it about her. The other thing it does is it takes all the air out of your tires about distancing yourself. When you just call yourself on it and you just tell her and she says, that's fine, honey, just sit a few feet away tonight. And then you go back to watching TV. There's a part of us that gets very comforted very comforted by the fact that we don't have to push them away and we don't have to run away. We can just say, I need a little space tonight. Is that okay? And when they give it that to us and we're, we own it and we're honest about it, every time it comes up, it's much more likely that, that that is going to come up less and less because we feel safer and safer. So don't doubt that your ability to date. Don't doubt the person you're dating. Question this feeling that you're having and bust yourself on it and call it out to the person you're with, or at least start exploring it in therapy, because this is good information that you're actually with the right person, not the wrong one. Great answer.
That made that tired me out. That is. I, I well, you got more, so hang on. Okay, I recently discovered my husband's porn and sex addiction and confronted him about it. He admitted he's an addict and started going to therapy and twelve step meetings. Great. Based on some of the porn he watches and age of some of the females he's shown interest in, I'm worried about the safety of our 10-year-old daughter around him. We are currently separated. I don't believe he would do anything to harm her, but he clearly hasn't been able to control himself in the past. He's asked me what he can do to prove that he would never hurt her. I'm at a complete loss. Any thoughts? Well, I have thoughts, but you won't like them. Um, If your husband or ex-husband or part husband or whatever he is, if you have found him looking at underage images, and I'm just going to say it, I don't mean 17. I mean 12, 11, 14, 10. You know the difference between a young woman who looks like an adult and a young woman who is, is a child. If he's looking at more childlike images, then you have to, you have to call the Department of Children's Services and you have to report him because it is not your job as a mother to determine whether he's safe for your children. You will never be able to figure that out. That's the job of people whose job it is to figure out, is this man safe to be on around kids? And yes, they will take his computer. And yes, they will go through his computer. And yes, the police might be involved. And yes, that might all be the right thing to do. I can't tell you, Cammy can't tell you, no one can tell you about the safety of your children. If your husband is consistently or persistently looking at images of young children or tweeners or, or even, or, or, or even mid, middle adolescents, you know, that's not okay. And it, I don't know what it means. And I don't, I don't think it's safe for you to say to me, well, I don't think my husband would ever touch. You just don't know. You know, and I, I'm sorry to say that, but you don't. And what mother would ever want to say, well, I trusted him, but then I was wrong. I don't think you want to be that mother. So these are legal issues. These are um, really serious issues. And they're not issues that we can take on here. They're issues that you need to seek professional support for, knowing that you're going to have to probably enlist a professional who can help you have the proper people find this out. Because if you feel concerned, and 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 I'm and and you know I I I can't tell you what is a legitimate concern, whether it's one image or a hundred, I don't know, because I'm not there and I'm not assessing. But if you feel concerned, then you have a responsibility to act so that you can protect your children or child from any harm that he might cause. And I can tell you this that because I've been on the other side of the situation in terms of doing investigations that we don't investigate to get people in trouble or to keep them from their children, or we just investigate to keep people safe. And if there is a reason that your husband should be monitored when he's with your kids, then let's get him monitored when he's with your kids so that your children never ever come to harm and you never ever have to doubt yourself and, and the, the decisions that you're making now. Um, Tammy? Well, I just, you know, yes, it seems like having a thorough and proper assessment of, um, you know, of him and his behaviors, et cetera. You know, we do get a fair number of calls for people for a treatment situation. So um, uh, we, um, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and let me say that actually, thank you, Tammy, for calling that out. Um, there is another option than calling child services. By the way, I would have no other option. I have a legal, legal obligation in the state of California. If you tell me that your spouse is looking at underage porn, I have to report him, period, the end. But if you live in other states that don't have that reporting law, and there are other states that don't have those reporting laws, um, you can find a psychologist to do a psychosexual assessment of your husband. There are things called an ABLE screening, A-B-E-L. Um, there is also, there are other, um, what's another? Um, oh, the penile plethysmograph. I'm not going to ask you to spell that, Tammy. I know how to spell that. Um, I believe it. Plethysmograph. But anyway, there are measurements and instruments and measures of sexual attraction. And if you are terrified that, oh my God, if I had to report my husband, he'd get arrested and we'd lose our family. You know, if that is your absolute fear, and I can understand that, um, or he'll hate you forever or whatever, and you have the means to go to a psychologist who understands how to do this kind of testing and get him evaluated for offender testing, you know, that is another way to protect your children. But your guesses, your feelings, your ideas, your 
it doesn't really hold weight under who this man might or might not be. You have to find out. And there is a really good treatment center that works with guys for 28 days that does um, the assessment while they're in treatment. So that can be a win-win. Um, you know, if you need information on that, let me know. We do, by the way, we do run treatment. And by the way, I prefer if someone's going to treatment, please come to us because we do great work. But we do sincerely refer to programs and organizations all over the country. And certainly, I just want you guys to know, anybody who calls for a referral, we don't get kickbacks. We, we don't get anything from that. We just refer to people we know and trust. But as far as residential treatment or workshops, we're going to refer to ourselves because I think our work is, well, I think that we've earned most of the people out there doing the work are people I've trained. So I feel like I deserve and have earned the ability to say what, what we do is pretty darn good. So. Well, yeah, and we don't pretend to do everything. We're not a hundred bed treatment center that, you know, we can fix everything. You know, we, we just work with men with sex addiction, intimacy disorders, or co-occurring sex addiction and chemical dependency. That's all we do. But I think we do it with excellence and with integrity. And I, you know, I, I value that. That's why I hang around. Okay, so probably the last question of the night. I'm doing work for betrayal trauma, individual therapy, EMDR groups, uh, Sunday night with Angela Spearman. Great, thank you. And she loves her. That's great. I assume it's she. Small groups at church and educating myself in some semblance of self-care. I sometimes feel a good and hopeful and strong, but sometimes I break down really bad. How long is this up and down cycle of early recovery? I'm hoping to heal fast and everyone seems to uh, be rushing me to move on, but it doesn't feel easy. That's a great question. What doesn't feel easy moving on from what? I'm sorry. From the, so from the betrayal trauma. Wow. So, you know, so it sounds like she's doing all these great things, right. but still struggling with, you know, gosh, I'm feeling good. And then oh, I'm not feeling good. And so it's that up and down. Um, I mean, I, I'm going to give you a stock answer, but I think that every, um, Every partner I've ever worked with is different, um, but here's something that all partners and addicts should hear. Um, the time that it takes for a partner to recover from betrayal is always going to be longer than the person who betrayed her or him would like. In other words, addicts, you guys would like the partners to get over it as soon as possible, and partners, it can take you a year, 18 months longer to really heal Hold on a second. I got a, a spouse in the in the. Uh, okay, there's something I got to go deal with a family issue because I've got somebody who's actually ill and I need to attend to it. So let me just finish this sentence or this comment, Tammy. I pretty okay. Need to go. Okay. Um, let's just get back into that. What was the? So it's mean, betrayal trauma. How long is it going to be up and down? You know, you're going to be up and down for first of all, if you're still involved with this person. I'm assuming a male. Has he stopped the addictive behavior? Is he working on himself? Is he being a decent human being? Because if he's still lying, cheating, and around you, you're not going to feel better anytime soon because your pot is constantly stirred. If you're no longer living with this person or involved with this person and or they are really working on things, then it could be a year or a year and a half before you're feeling kind of like yourself again. And this tr betrayal trauma experience can take that long. Now, I think if you're struggling with deep feelings of depression. I don't want to get out of bed. I, I can't face the day. I, I'm over, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, that is something I would go see someone about because you should be functional. You know, you should be able to get through the day, go to work, even if you cry yourself to sleep at night, a couple of days a week. But it should be that, a couple of days a week. You should feel okay more often than you don't, or at least as often as you don't. Um, and that can go on for as long as a year or longer. Um, yeah. I got to go run. I'm sorry, guys. I got a thing I got to take care of. Have a wonderful evening. Um, Tammy, you can carry us through for the rest. Well, we're just about done. I do have a couple more comments. Thank you. I will um, talk to you tomorrow. So, yes, ma'am. Okay. You. So there's a couple of questions in here. First of all, the person that, um, uh, th that about the swimsuit, husband stepped up. We love hearing that. It's really nice when they um, do that. And then somebody commented that they were struggling with some deep depression, suicidal ten su suicidal thoughts. You know, th that isn't to be ignored. Um, I'm just going to beg you to uh, go see somebody who's actually qualified to diagnose. You know, e even in recovery, there are some of us that need some sort of medication to help um, stabilize. I, you know, I always liken it to, 
you know, my chemicals are out of balance and I need something to balance it. You know, no harm, no foul. If you get the right doctor, you're treating that, but please don't ignore that. I can't answer all the rest of these I, and I'm not qualified to. So, so please join us again next week. Um, Dr. David will be on, on, um, Wednesday night at 5 p.m. Pacific time. The old, no, it's not the old, yeah, it's the old lady posse group. For those of you um, that feel like that qualifies, that's on at 8.30 tomorrow morning Pacific time. Um, there's a number of options. There's a men's partners group. There's a women's uh, sex and love addict drop-in group tomorrow. So there's lots more options. So uh, Wednesday morning, Troy Love will be on at 9.30 Pacific time with a webinar. So good stuff. Please keep coming back. Uh, for those of you, you know, if you've got something specific, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. Don't hesitate to email me. I will do my best. Sometimes I give a recommendation and sometimes those people aren't the right fit for you or do something that I just go, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, we really do try to give you um, recommendations and referrals for qualified support. So, so grateful you're all here. Thank you and uh, see you next time.